Uh, I'm Doug Seafelt and Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll just be between you, you and I on that one. <laughs> um, that poor horse that we're beating to death. It's just. Uh <laughs> anyway, um, so I'm uh, really uh, pleased to chair this uh, panel on public memory, Buffalo Bill's legacy in public memory. Um, we, we've talked a lot about, uh, and Bruce just mentioned, the scholarship that comes out of this, and, and oftentimes we mean the academic scholarship um, that reaches um, a certain audience in, in a certain time frame. But of course, there's been, in, our, in my field of history, there's been uh, over the past, you know, maybe 40 or 50 years, a real development of what we call public history, right? Uh, I went to um, graduate school at an institution that gives a PhD in public history. And I, so I went to school with a bunch of people who are now um, you know, running museums and national park sites and things like that, where they're engaging with the public and they're interpreting these um, stories of the past, these um, and oftentimes these primary sources and, and giving them the context in a meaningful way where everyone from you know, bus loads of children all the way up to lifelong learners can uh, be uh, moved and, and, and educated and stimulated by their experience with sometimes a site or in this case, you know, a figure and his legacy. So what we have today is a panel of early career scholars who are all coming at this from a public history angle. So um, when, you, when you listen to what they have to say, Think about that. Think about the, um, the kind of audiences that they're talking about and the way that the, um, the Buffalo Bill legacy and its many facets is being uh, communicated to the public at large. So we're going to start with um, Laura Arada, and she is um, uh, assistant professor of history at Oklahoma State University. Um, she has a recent article called Terror and Tourism, Lynching, Legend, and the Montana Vigilantes, and it, it's uh, in the Pacific Northwest quarterly. She's working on a book manuscript that will be uh, coming soon um, titled Race and the Wild West, Sarah Bickford and the Leg Legend of Virginia City, Montana, 1870 to 1930. Laura's here to talk to us today about Mickey Mouse Cowboys, Memory, Authenticity, and Disney's Wild West. Please welcome Laura. Thank you. Thank you all for being here early on the final day. Um, it's been said a bunch of times, but I don't think we can say it enough. Thank you again to all the staff here at Center of the West for this really incredible symposium. There's such a, a depth of scholarship here and historians that you know, not only inspired me, but made my work possible in a lot of ways. Um, being here has been sort of, it's like the junior historian equivalent of getting selected to write on the Deadwood stage at the end of the show. <laughs> it's a little overwhelming. It's been very exciting. So thank you to everyone who's delivered amazing scholarship and uh, been really gracious with your time. It's really an honor to be here. So on to Mickey Mouse Cowboys. Is perhaps no more overtly commodified incarnation of Buffalo Bill's Wild West than Euro Disney's stunningly popular dinner show, The Legend de Buffalo Bill, now with Mickey and Friends, which has played to more than 10 million visitors since opening in 1992. And while it's tempting to write the whole thing off as tourist kitsch, The Legend of Buffalo Bill is bigger than that, and that is what led me to Paris. Throughout my own career as a historian, William F. Cody, either as a flesh and blood representation of the Wild West or a ghost that continues to define it, has haunted my narrative margins. He's an inescapable presence. No one did more to define the idea of the Wild West, and no single figure continues to loom larger in its contemporary manifestations than Buffalo Bill. But Cody and I go deeper than this, too. The historian in me will never escape the child, who learned to define herself in relation to those manifestations. Disneyland is supposed to be about fun and families. Right before I was scheduled to leave for Disneyland, my father died. And with him went my last connection to both the grandfather who helped raise me and the California ranch where I grew up. So not only would I be going to Disneyland alone and sad, I was also afraid I was going to lose part of Cody too. His representation there, 
by definition, cannot be authentic, despite Disney's claims, or so I thought. I would have to let go of three men whose lives had shaped my own and acknowledge the often tenuous connections between authenticity and memory. Richard White has written that although the remembered past is almost never precisely accurate, it also almost always expresses deeper truths. This is as true for my memories of Cody as it was for those of my father and grandfather, and now I had to confront all of our Wests at once. Despite its numerous claims to represent the authentic Wild West show, the actual veracity of Disney's Cody has received only limited scholarly attention. Maybe this is partly due to the fact that we know the Disney version of him cannot really be the real Buffalo Bill. This is not earth-shattering news. But there are some deeper truths behind it. The inclusion of a Wild West show at this Disney resort was intentional. Early research revealed that the idea of the frontier resonated with Europeans and that they associated the United States very clearly with the Wild West. Like Cody, Disney's show is intended to educate by giving Europeans insight into the spirit and history of America. Promotional materials insist that Disney's horses and buffalo come from the actual plains of the American West. Its cowboys are real cowboys who can handle a rope. Its Indians are real Indians. And even the dinner is served throughout the evening on tin plates worthy of the roughest cowboys. Disney gives the impression that the audience is being invited along not just to view the show, but to participate in experiencing some part of the American West through it. But the three individualized American characters, Buffalo Bill, Annie Oakley, and Sitting Bull, must of course be representations portrayed by actors. And now they have to share the stage with Sheriff Mickey, who along with Minnie, dressed as a Hollywood showgirl, complete with pink high heels, right, and Goofy, and Chippendale, joined the show in a 2009 revamping effort. One of the most compelling aspects to Cody and one that continues to intrigue us in the 21st century was his skill at interweaving fact and fiction until one was indistinguishable from the other. As Louis Warren has demonstrated, it was this deafness at creating myths grounded in the realities of the frontier which blurred the line between what really happened on the Great Plains and what the audience wanted to believe had happened. This was what made both Buffalo Bill and his namesake show such persistent phenomenon. Cody's legacy, as handed to me by my grandfather and my father, shaped my own fascination with the Wild West. Growing up on 1,200 acres, where my family had roots reaching back more than a century, I was brought up to believe that I carried on an authentic legacy. I knew what it was to work with cattle and horses. Disneyland was four hours away, but I had never been there. I was still very young when Buffalo Bill entered my consciousness but I knew I was expected to revere him. My lesson started early with a battered 1943 copy of Frank Beals' Buffalo Bill. My father had absconded from his middle school with it when he was nine. As far as I know, it's the only thing he ever stole. Of all the Western heroes I was supposed to learn from, Buffalo Bill was by far the most practical. If I was thrown from a horse, Buffalo Bill always got right back in the saddle. If I was tired, Buffalo Bill most certainly would have kept going. If I was hungry or cold, Buffalo Bill had survived in much worse conditions. Buffalo Bill was the most consistently invoked figurehead of my childhood. To me, he came to represent the whole West. As a historian, he continued to fascinate me in all of his complexities. He centered my own history. Somehow, according to my grandfather, we descended from cowboys and farmers who had always been descended from cowboys and farmers. History began in that context. We emerged from the same far western mythology that Horace Billings had imprinted on the mind of a young William Cody when the two met during Cody's childhood. Warren demonstrates that a chance encounter with a horseman from the west and finely beaded buckskin shaped Cody's impressions of the Wild West. My grandfather served a similar function, and because of him, I often lamented having been born in the wrong century. And living in California, nothing could have represented the century I was so rudely forced to live in more clearly than Mickey Mouse, though he had no practical place in my childhood. If Buffalo Bill defined everything that was nostalgic about the West, Disneyland encapsulated all the things I was conditioned to reject. By the 1990s, the sleepy farming community where my grandparents and my father were born 
was flooded with new money Silicon Valley types. They came, they built, and they pushed out a way of life. So my West was under attack, and nothing represented that more clearly than the cartoon mouse in Anaheim. While my classmates who could afford it spent their vacations with Mickey Mouse, I milked cows, broke horses, and learned from my grandfather about Mickey Mouse cowboys. It started when a new neighbor came to my grandfather and said he had questions about raising cattle of his own. Specifically, he wanted to know how many he could run on his newly acquired acres. I recall my grandfather suggesting that a small herd was going to be plenty, maybe 20 cows, otherwise they were going to need a lot of hay to get through the winter. So I'd have room for about 10 or a dozen cows, the neighbor nodded thoughtfully. 20, I think you could do 20, maybe 25, my grandfather corrected. He was being patient. Well, 20 total, the neighbor replied. 10 of them would need to be bulls, right? <laughs> we have some true Westerners in the audience. <laughs> my grandfather's laughter failed to disguise his anger and disgust as the man drove off down the road. One bull for each cow, he spat. Goddamn Mickey Mouse cowboys anyway. It became his go-to epithet, used to describe anything or anyone that was inauthentic. The neighbor, as I recall, never did buy any cows, and I buried my grandfather and left California still never having been to Disneyland. He'd been gone for a decade, but the idea of Mickey Mouse cowboys followed me to Paris. The building in which Disney's Wild West is housed is topped by a curved awning proclaiming the Wild West show with Mickey and friends. Unless there be any confusion, to the left of this, rappelling down a rope, is Mickey Mouse in a cowboy hat. Passing through these doors meant confronting two Wests that never were and acknowledging that in many ways my own was no more authentic than the one encased at Disneyland. Both were simulacra, performances based upon performances that reified something which never existed. Ironically, Disney's Wild West is perhaps most accurate in employing Cody's tried and true method of molding ideas of the West onto something that audiences really truly want to believe in. It is necessarily reductive, only so much can fit in 90 minutes, and Disney acknowledges that it does not represent complex or inclusive histories. Its formula requires that both Buffalo Bill and Mickey be malleable enough to sustain an illusion that the legend de Buffalo Bill is authentic, even as Disney struggles to define what that means. Cody, of course, struggled with his own authenticity paradox. He was, Paul Hutton writes, like the nation he came to symbolize, a bundle of contradictions, a living artifact of a pioneer past playing out his role in the world of telephones, motion pictures, automobiles, airplanes, skyscrapers, and world wars. I could relate to this. I'd grown up watching my grandfather farm with a team of draft horses while our nearest neighbor flew to work every day in his own private helicopter. So my West, separated by a century, was as conflicted as Cody's had been. As a historian, I know not to believe unquestioningly in legends, but this involved my memories, which is different and much more difficult. It was fitting to confront all of it in Europe. My grandfather's heritage, as it turned out, was not one of cowboys, but poor Italian and Portuguese immigrants. And he hated it so much that he took the most Western option available, reinvented himself into an American cowboy, and spent the rest of his life insisting things had always been that way. In reality, Grandpa didn't chase down his first cow until he was in his 20s, and he never did learn how to throw a rope. Disney's Wild West is filled with representations of what the 19th century West was supposed to have looked like, if it ever resembled a John Ford Western. A stagecoach stands before a hallway called Tumbleweed Gulch. Tickets are sold from the Comstock Hotel. Patrons queue along a faux boardwalk that fronts an assay office, a nondescript general store, and a livery stable. Guests are advised that the arena contains straw, sand, and trail dust, which may be hazardous to your health. After receiving a complimentary straw cowboy hat, visitors are funneled by Colonel William F. Cody's saloon while a pre-show band plays American staples like You Get a Line, I'll Get a Pull Honey and Red River Valley. Goofy appears midway through this to demonstrate proper hat waving and cowboy yeehaw yelling shouting technique. You're gonna need that for the show. It all concludes with a rendition of Buffalo Bill's favorite song, Y'all Come, which wasn't actually written until 1953 
so you're left to wonder when this authentic stuff kicks in. At a fundamental level, Disney's Wild West is the antithesis of the authentic West. In keeping with the Disney formula of careful staging, a color-coded system of organization neatly brackets every part of this show. Everything from the bands on guest straw hats to the Western-style shirts on the waitstaff to the clowns and the cowboys in the arena corresponds to one of four colors associated with the seating sections. Audience members are assigned to one of four ranches, the Red River of Colorado, Gold Star of Texas, Blue Moon of Wyoming, or Green Mountain of Montana. The real West was many things, but it was never this appallingly neat and tidy. If anything, it was, as Patricia Nelson Limerick described it, unforgiving in its messiness. Buffalo Bill centers this production before the show even begins on a canvas that stretches across the far end of the arena. It's a depiction of him against a backdrop of the Monument Valley. It's a landscape that has essentially nothing to do with the setting of the show or any of the actual characters in it, but Disney calls this authentic. The most recent casting call for the show, which just closed in April, spelled out how Disney defines this authenticity. Cowboys must be of Caucasian, African American, or Latino ethnicity, and accomplished equestrians with rodeo or working ranch skill. They're expected to participate in a variety of roles, from that of the authentic old western cowboy to working with Disney's timeless characters. Prospective Sioux Indians are required to be Native American because they will accurately depict Native Americans as seen in Buffalo Bill's original show. One former casting director insisted that this was because we need the roles to be credible. That's why we go to the United States and Canada in search of that authenticity. But even Disney has to admit that this has limits. To use just one example, the two exclusively Indian vignettes in the show Sitting Bull and the Native Americans and Hunting Across the Great Plains, total only about four and a half and six minutes, respectively. The sections involving Mickey and Minnie, by contrast, stretch for over 26 minutes, more than double the time allotted for any other act. This might all be a lot more convincing, authenticity-wise, if we didn't also need to explain the inclusion of a cartoon mouse who wasn't even created until a decade after Cody's death. So the content of the show, in other words, is not at the heart of authenticity at Disneyland. Even Buffalo Bill's actual Wild West, which routinely stretched for two to three hours and employed hundreds of performers, as opposed to Disney's dozen or so who are in the arena at any one time, did not have time for the kind of complexity that would give real deep meaning to the history of the West. But Cody relied on an array of techniques to capture audience interest, including displaying the real people who had been in the West and allowing viewers to decide for themselves how they stacked up against their own images. Disney's attempted to recreate this with real cowboys and Indians and livestock, but even if we set aside the reality that cowboys and Indians were never the entirety of the West, two realities are inescapable here. Cody is dead, and this is Disneyland. These two facts dictate everything. It's not surprising that in a closed arena at an urban resort, all of Annie Oakley's shooting tricks are mechanized, or that in Europe, where animal protection laws are stringent, bronco busting is off limits. But the scenes which openly promise an authentic representation of the American West are problematic. Driving the cattle herds, for instance, is proclaimed in show programs to be a glimpse of the cowboys' daily lives as they herd their cattle from the vast open lands of Texas to the big cities of the north. In addition to gazing on some authentic Texas longhorns, spectators are told they will witness the amazing skills with, with, with which the cowboys lasso their cattle and set up camp for the night. In Buffalo Bill's original Wild West, the Cowboy Fun Act did include lariat throwing, but that's about where the comparisons end here, and you have to forgive the longhorns for getting pretty complacent. As a production, this act is more Three Stooges than Wild West. There's a choreographed fight scene with an oversized frying pan. There are cheesy karate moves. One cowboy brandishes a machete as he prepares to search for meat to include in their campfire dinner. In the 1990s, this act featured live chickens and a chopping block. <laughs> oh, no, you ain't, another cowboy always intervened before the chicken was actually imperiled. Because this is Disneyland as if we needed a reminder. As of 2016, the show has gone strictly to rubber chickens. They threaten a cow now with the machete. 
and live mice as Mickey Mouse and friends pop out of chuck wagons and join the traditional cowboy antics, singing and competing in frontier games round the fire, safe within the circle created by the wagons, all two of them. The cowboys actually did more work before Mickey joined this party. And while Buffalo Bill's Wild West did allow for humor, it's doubtful to me that this is what Cody had in mind. I assume that my lived experience here is closer to Cody's and that there have been no life-size mice dancing to Cotton Eye Joe on any of the cattle roundups I've ever been a part of. Not to mention that so much shooting and shouting would have spooked the herd and my grandpa would have shot the life-size mice. <laughs> the bigger issue here is that this West, as one miffed spectator put it, does not seem to know what it wants to be. Fair enough. This is a conquest narrative stripped of everything that conquest entailed. Even the Deadwood stage has been washed clean. In the 1880s, show promoters billed it as the tomb of its passengers in which over 200 persons had died. Buffalo Bill, one historian notes, wrote frontier history in blood. In Disney's version, Indians appear and steal the horses, leaving the stagecoach stranded and vulnerable to some nondescript outlaws. In some seasons, they even drop in from the ceiling on cables. They're the one true representation of danger in Disney's Wild West, and even they do not die in the arena. They defeat themselves long before the 5th Cavalry arrives with a fresh team of horses and chocolate for the audience. This is the heart of the matter. Buffalo Bill's Wild West was always carefully scripted, but it was never devoid of violence. How much was included fluctuated, featuring less in some venues and more in others, but it was ever present. In London, for example, some critics requested finding a new way to clear the dead from the arena after battle scenes, because watching them get up and walk away at the conclusions of spectacles ruins the realism. Other audiences requested more scalping, noting that wigs and carmine came cheap. Disney's Wild West has to be different. It cannot allow for violence or bloodshed or despair. But how then can Disney claim authenticity while divorcing the Wild West from something so intrinsic to Buffalo Bill? In the end, authenticity isn't really what we're looking for. We buy tickets to view an idea of something, not its reality in this context. But Disney's attention to the visceral response the idea of the Wild West evokes and its reification of an already formulaic West are its real claims to authenticity. And since ideas are shaped by those who hold them, viewers can craft whatever West they want to from the experience. One thing that hasn't changed since Buffalo Bill's time is that they often disagree about what this Wild West is supposed to be. The whole show could have been done without animals, which would have much improved the whole thing, one disaffected reviewer insisted. Another complained that the show is about some Indian rituals and gets a bit boring after a while, while a third was confused by Indians without bows and arrows. One viewer lamented that you need a pretty good understanding of Texan speak, even though half the dialogue is in French. The overwhelming majority of viewers are perhaps a little too convinced and have been lured in by glossy confections of hyper-reality. It has all the sights, sounds, and smells of the Wild West, one delighted spectator enthused. I imagine this to be similar to Buffalo Bill's real show. Double exclamation point. Having a cowboy hat made me live out my childhood dream and getting to shout out yee-haw and it being totally normal was awesome, another concluded. And the meal is what you would expect if you were crossing the West in a wagon, complete with Coca-Cola. One trait that positive and negative reviewers alike share is the sentiment that there just wasn't enough Mickey, even though the Disney characters appear for a full third of the show. Whereas Cody was successful because he responded to changing times, Disney has to freeze the show in a moment that represents at best one small part of Buffalo Bill's Wild West. Its best claim to authenticity is in carrying on a tradition of creating a West that audiences still want to believe in. And in a way, this is fitting because that's why we're all here today. We are still captivated by an idea that Cody gave us. It still has an emotional hold over us. Perhaps the most significant impact of Disney's reinterpretation then is that in it, Cody's been divested of his position as a connective link between the frontier past and modern present. At Disneyland, he belongs safely to the past. So Mickey Mouse, ironically, gets to win this authenticity contest because he has no requirements other than to just be there. In closing the show, 
Disney's Cody proclaims that wherever there's a sunset, there's a west. But there's only one Buffalo Bill's wild west. And this, in a way, is true, because still he rides, as Warren has concluded, across our imagined horizon, mine included. Thank you, Laura, that was terrific.